Retina Rounds, episode number 175. Diabetic Tractional and Regmatogenous Retinal Detachment. Posterior hyaloid elevation is a critical step when performing vitrectomy for a regmatogenous retinal detachment. In diabetic patients, this step can be challenging due to the presence of vitreous schesis, tight vitreoretinal retinal adhesions, and the lack of countertraction when elevating membranes and vitreous from detached retina. Our guest surgeon is Dr. Ramon Bringue Freitas, a vitreoretinal retinal specialist at Evangelico Villa Velha Hospital in Brazil. His patient is a 42-year-old phacic diabetic male with mild tractional membranes who now presents with a macula involving regmatogenous retinal detachment. Let's check out the surgical approach, and thank you, Dr. Bringue Freitas, for sharing this case. Okay, starting at the beginning of the case, this is a 25-gauge pars plane of vitrectomy. Again, this is a, a phacic diabetic patient who has undergone some prior panretinal photocoagulation. And Dr. Brigue Freitas is going to start by performing a core vitrectomy. It appears here in this inferior and potentially also in the nasal quadrant that there is a partial posterior vitreous detachment. And you can see that he is focusing his efforts here roughly at the level of the equator, and that's going to serve two purposes. One, the turbulence from the vitrectomy is going to help to propagate that PVD. You can see he's propagating it around nasally. And two, it's going to help him to segment the anterior and the posterior cortical vitreous. So you can see here in the superior quadrant, some of this vitreous hemorrhage is being, uh, is being removed. And there's a fibrovascular membrane or stock now uh, that's present along the suprotemporal arcade with an associated posterior retinal break. So now he's trimming back some of the peripheral vitreous here nasally and now inferiorly. Now we don't see that this, uh, the, the vitreous has really been elevated yet over the posterior pole and over this temporal area of more bullous retinal detachment. You can see here more peripherally that there appears to be a retinal, uh, a retinal break here and so he's trimming uh, some of the vitreous adhesions off of that retinal break. Now trimming back this fibrovascular stalk and now aspirating over the optic nerve here to try to elevate uh, the uh, hyaloid over the macula. But you can see as he's uh, aspirating there, some of that submacular hemorrhage is coming out through that posterior break. Again, aspirating to try to engage the posterior hyaloid, particularly over the macula, to try to propagate the PVD more temporally, uh, removing the uh, vitreous adhesions in this more bullously detached temporal retina. So now, um, not seeing that elevation, he's um, instilling some triamcinolone to better visualize the posterior cortical vitreous. Uh, he's uh, now or removing uh, the, the bulk of that triamcinolone, and we're not seeing much uh, staining here over the posterior pole. Uh, he's trying to aspirate, trying to engage an edge of the vitreous, but just not seeing it over the posterior pole. So now he's going to instill some, uh, some uh, tissue blue uh, and is now evacuating that to try to see if he might be able to stain some of the uh, any, uh, posterior membranes and also uh, potentially some of the posterior cortical vitreous. Uh, he's removing uh, that, uh, that tissue blue and now he's switched to a high magnification view and using ILM forceps, you can see he's, he can visualize now a membrane over the, over the macula and this is very nicely elevating this over the macula. So this is not a, an epiretinal membrane, but this is in fact the posterior cortical vitreous. Uh, and so this is a very, very important and critical step to elevate uh, the vitreous here over the macula. And now he's propagating that vitreous detachment using the forceps in a more temporal location to try to propagate the PVD temporally, where um, again, the retina is more bullously detached and those peripheral retinal breaks are present. Now he's uh, peeling and sort of following the surface of the retina, pulling in a posterior to peripheral fashion. Uh, and um, now, uh, uh, you know, elevating up this area here, you can see very nicely that the hyaloid has uh, clearly been elevated in this location. Now, Dr. Bringe Freitas is going to switch from a high magnification view of the posterior pole to a, a more wide angle visualization so you can see uh, the uh, temporal retina a little bit more clearly. You can see he's now engaging this edge that's been elevated and then lifting. Now, important here not to pull anterior posteriorly. You can see here maybe a bit of a deep pinch and there's a, an iatrogenic retinal break there in that infrotemporal quadrant. Um, now, again, engaging this, this edge and lifting it up carefully. The, the challenge here is that the, vitri the vitreoretinal adhesions can be very tight in diabetic patients. 
And when you combine that with this, um, this uh, regbitogenous detachment, the lack of counter-traction can make elevation of this residual vitreous very challenging. Now, Dr. Bringy Freitas is doing a very nice job here of using the, uh, of using the ILM forceps to engage the posterior edge uh, of the hyaloid and then very carefully elevating this up. Now one, one other option here would be to use a bimanual approach. So one could put in a chandelier and then using a bimanual approach, it'll help to create a little bit of counter traction uh, to separate uh, the residual uh, cortical vitreous from the, uh, from the retinal surface. You can see again, uh, using the forceps here, this is being uh, carefully peeled back uh, off of this more bullously detached temporal retina. It's an important, it's, it will be important here to make sure that that, um, that uh, hyaloid has been uh, elevated and, um, and ex that, it, that vitreous detachment has been extended out to the retinal periphery where those peripheral retinal breaks are present. So now Dr. Bringer Freitas is using the cutter here, uh, using some of the turbulence to try to propagate the PVD, aspirating the posterior edge of this uh, of the residual hyaloid here, and you can see that there's um, p potentially some residual traction over those retinal breaks. So using scleral depression in this area can be very helpful to trim uh, any residual vitreous traction on those breaks thereby decreasing the risk uh, that uh, any residual vitreous can contract and reopen those breaks. So now you can see he's uh, gone to an air fluid exchange and he's draining through the peripheral retinal breaks, tilting the eye uh, to uh, bring uh, any uh, fluid into the dependent position at those peripheral retinal breaks. Now, an option here would be rather than draining through the peripheral retinal breaks would be to drain through the more posterior retinal breaks to get uh, a more complete flattening of the retina. And uh, that's uh, that can uh, help to get uh, more complete um, uh, uh, takes with the laser which he's now applying here. So you can see this uh, laser retinopexy that's being applied around the retinal breaks. We're getting some inconsistent takes up on the posterior side of those retinal breaks. And the reason is because there is some, some residual subretinal fluid that's present here. So again, draining the subretinal fluid, not so much through the peripheral breaks, but through those more posterior breaks can help to get better flattening of the retina. Now he's aspirating over the optic nerve to remove any fluid that's on the pre-retinal surface. And now he's gonna go back to the laser and try to augment uh, some of the retinopexy, particularly uh, uh, now around uh, the anterior side of the brakes, but particularly around the posterior edges of the brakes where those retinal takes were inconsistent due to the presence of some residual subretinal fluid. Okay, applying some uh, laser retinopexy around this iatrogenic retinal break. Uh, and around this posterior break along the uh, supratemporal arcade, but we're see, you see we're not getting good takes here, and the reason for that is there's still some residual subretinal fluid. So here I think it would be very very important to use a soft tip to try to drain the fluid through those retinal breaks. That'll help to completely flatten the retina in that location and allow for better um, uh, laser uptake in these areas. So now Dr. Bringe Freitas is applying some uh, panretinal photocoagulation, augmenting the prior PRP uh, and treating some of these areas uh, that were not previously treated. Again, now trying to laser, trying to apply some PRP in this area where there's residual subretinal fluid temporally. Again, uh, not going to get good laser takes here when there's still some residual subretinal fluid. So um, again, draining through the posterior breaks may allow for the retina to better flatten and to get better PRP takes uh, in that temporal quadrant. Here in the, in the nasal quadrant, we can see uh, the retina is uh, still attached here and the PRP is being applied again to areas uh, that have not been previously treated. Okay, now once the PRP is done, again, there's going to be an uh, additional air fluid exchange to remove any pre-retinal fluid. And now uh, Dr. Bringe Freitas is instilling some oil. Oil has been chosen as a tamponade agent in this case, although generally speaking, I think uh, my preference would be to use uh, gas fill to save the patient from an additional surgery. Okay, so here's some take home points. Now, due to the presence of vitreous schesis, which is very common in diabetic eyes, it's very important to confirm that the posterior hyaloid has been completely elevated. Dr. Bringe Freitas showed us the use of triamcinolone and tissue blue to visualize the residual posterior cortical vitreous over the macula and the temporal quadrant, which he was able to elevate with forceps. Now, in some cases, bimanual dissection may be necessary to elevate the hyaloid and any associated tractional membranes, uh, which can be more challenging due to the lack of counter-traction in detached retina. 
Some residual vitreous and tractional membranes may contract and reopen breaks, so it's important to fully elevate the hyaloid and delaminate fibrovascular membranes that are in proximity to retinal breaks. Generally speaking, all membranes should be removed within one to two clock hours of a retinal break. Now, in this case, there are a few steps that I would have done differently. Since the, there were posterior breaks present, I would have drained the fluid through the posterior breaks to get better flattening of the retina. This is going to allow for more efficient pexy around the peripheral retinal breaks, more effective PRP in the temporal quadrant, and more effective laser around the posterior breaks. It's important not to be too aggressive with laser in areas of shallow fluid and to avoid attempting laser in areas of detached retina since lasering these areas with subretinal fluid can create retinal breaks and that can result in a recurrent retinal detachment. Please let us know your thoughts on how you would tackle this case in the comments section. And again, thank you Dr. Bringy Freitas for sharing this case. If you enjoyed this video, please visit us at retinarounds.com. There you can sign up for our email list. You'll get a notification every time a new video is posted. And if you have an interesting video or a tip or trick that you'd like to share, please follow the links on our website and you can upload your video there. Thanks so much for watching.